Welcome to the first edition of the ECS podcast. I'm Rocky Calvo, Executive Director of the Electrochemical Society. The purpose of this program is to connect the dots between the sciences, our everyday lives, and the sustainability of the planet. Dr. John Turner is a perfect first guest for our show. He has made an immense impact on the field of electrochemistry through his research in hydrogen production and innovation in fuel cells. He joined the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in 1979, where he's now a research fellow. And he began his work on photoelectrochemical water splitting for hydrogen production. He's also be giving the ECS lecture at the 227th ECS meeting in Chicago. It's this May uh, 2015. The title of his talk will be Hydrogen from Photoelectrochemical Water Splitting. What's it going to take? So thank you, Dr. Turner, for being here with us today. Uh, I'd like to start uh, by asking you to just give us a little bit more uh, background on, uh, on yourself uh, and what has led you to these interesting areas of research. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm originally from Idaho, and uh, uh, my grandparents had a farm, and uh, they homesteaded out there, and I sort of got the feeling up uh, the earth and renewing and that sort of thing. And so as I started to go through uh, my university uh, degree program as, you know, on your way to a PhD, it became more and more apparent that uh, energy issues uh, were going to be one of the key issues coming to society. So I started uh, moving. Of course, electrochemistry nowadays uh, is really the key. We have fuel cells, we have electrolyzers, we have batteries. Uh, all this thing going on in transportation and uh, and storage, it all comes down to uh, you know electrochemical energy converters. And uh, so very early on, I was uh, actually I worked as an undergrad on batteries. Um, so I just kind of uh, kept kept going that way. And I, I post doc at Caltech. I had a chance to meet Heinz Gerischer there, who uh, was essentially one of the founding fathers, if you will, of photoelectrochemistry. And we worked together, and uh, when I moved to Enwell, I started working for Art Nozick, who, uh, who, who uh, also does photoelectrochemistry. And I've been working on it ever since, trying to find a way uh, to economically produce hydrogen from sunlight and water uh, directly. So you've, you've named a, a few very important people already in our world that uh, had uh, influenced you and, and your research career. Uh, Heinz Gerischer, of course, uh, we have an award named after him. He's uh, uh, an, an important scientist in our field, obviously, and has had uh, influences on a lot of, a lot of our, our members and, and people that have, have touched electrochemistry. But also Art Nozick, who I haven't seen in many, many years, was uh, on the board of directors of ECS when I, I came to the uh, society uh, around 1980. And so uh -huh. that, that kind of takes me back to something you already said, that uh, you recognize the importance of, of this field uh, far back. I mean, you, you came to NREL in, in 79, so it was in the 70s. What what enlightened you about the importance of this of this scientific discipline uh, back then? Well, back then we had this uh, oil embargo, and you had people in lines trying to get gasoline and that sort of thing, and it became pretty apparent just how um, vulnerable uh, society, well, U.S. in particular, but in society in general are, uh, to the vulgarities of the fossil fuel um, industry, up, the ups and downs, and uh, those kind of things, and then slowly, of course, climate change started to come into the picture, uh, which makes uh, moving away from these uh, carbon-based fuels even more imperative. Um, so <clears throat> that's been really good, and, and, and I wouldn't say I'm the only one at NREL this way. I mean, lots of, that's a, a lot of the motivation of the folks at uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab is indeed trying to address uh, these issues of a new energy system, a new paradigm in energy that is sustainable and will last for millennia. And those sort of things. That's that sort of uh, you know what's a lot of what's driving uh, the work and the research and the interest and the enthusiasm, if you will. Could you could you comment on the the trajectory of renewable energy? What do you think uh, we will we'll see in the coming years? Uh, it's interesting you ask that question because I get asked that question a lot in my lectures. 
And unfortunately, the, what I have to tell uh, the students in particular, uh, and the audience in general, is that it's really up to the politicians uh, to change the energy uh, infrastructure. We have pretty much all the technologies we need. We certainly need to be able to upscale them to get, get, get things cheaper. But if you just look at, for example, hydrogen economy, uh, kind of thing where you can you can make hydrogen with uh, photovoltaics, electrolysis, transport it in pipelines uh, like they do now, and use it for making ammonia and for transportation and that sort of thing. All that all that exists today, and now fuel cell vehicles are coming out. The issue is how do you put how do you replace a uh, essentially established infrastructure with a new one? Uh, what's your motivation for changing it? We have an example in the past of gasoline. Uh, it was basically legislated out of existence. It, you know, unleaded gasoline wasn't cheaper or better. Uh, it just except it had didn't have a lead in it. And I think that's that's. And we've seen what happens with wind and photovoltaics. You need political support in order to uh, change this huge uh, thing we have, this infrastructure. And uh, so we're. We're waiting on the technology. We're working on the technologies, trying to improve them, and, and when the time comes, hopefully we'll be ready um, with lower cost, uh, more efficient uh, energy conversion devices, if you will, making tricking sunlight into hydrogen and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, you're um, uh, sort of touching a nerve uh, of, you know, I guess for me personally, you know, having um, uh, spent... Uh, most of my career now here at the Electrochemical Society and developed. Uh, more recently, uh, a, a great appreciation for uh, the impact that, that the science can have. Um, and um, uh, so I, I subscribe to um, uh, the American Petroleum Institute's newsletter just to see how they present their view of the world. And I, I think it's interesting what you just said, how, uh, if I'm interpreting you correctly, that the greatest challenges. Uh, the thing that's uh, uh, the challenge in, in a, a faster trajectory is the uh, uh, the political support, uh, which the renewables uh, don't receive at least at not the level of the uh, the petroleum industry. And then, of course, you mentioned the infrastructure. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's. I mean, uh, the petroleum industry uh, understands, uh, you know how. So politicians are motivated, and of course they're trying to protect their interests and uh, their resources. Uh, there's trillions of dollars uh, uh, tied up in in uh, fuels and, and fossil fuels underground. Um, so yeah, it's not an easy easy move. I will say, in terms of politician, there's a there's one example that I like to give of something that that happened a, a little bit unexpectedly. Uh, President Bush. In 2003, uh, started this uh, hydrogen fuel initiative, and at that time, he said uh, he wanted uh, a child born today. Speaking of uh, his State of the Union address in 2003, a child born today could uh, have their first car be a fuel cell vehicle uh, running on hydrogen and pollution free. Well, uh, that would have been if you assume that the driving age is about 16. Not even in 2019 that we would have expected vehicles. They're out now. Toyota is releasing their vehicle uh, like, uh, soon and well this year, and, and other uh, Honda also. They're all releasing their vehicles early, uh, simply because of that. Uh, well, large mark, large part because of that presidential initiative that pushed these uh, technologies forward. So that just shows the, the what the power of. Uh, Politics and initiatives. If they're, uh, uh, you know, they have a good support, and uh, we got five years of support at that time to develop fuel cells and other things. So, um, I, I just as an example of how the technology is ready, uh, we just need to push, and we can actually come out with these things early, just like the fuel cell vehicles are coming out. Do you see what you consider to be uh, reasonable progress? Uh, I mean, you know, there's so much. Uh, that we hear, uh, you know, anecdotally, I guess, through, you know, members about uh, research funding drying up or, uh, you know, just a, a, a lack of support in some what I would think are important areas. Uh, what kind of progress are you seeing? Well, in terms of, of uh, research support, that's, uh, 
um, just a, a, I think a, a fallout or a follow-on, if you will, of simply the number of researchers. Uh, population grows. We have more uh, researchers, and budgets have not grown. Uh, they've been flat, but like they are, you know, but, but they've been flat, which basically means uh, you lose money by inflation. And uh, so it makes it more difficult to find research, and there's uh, a lot of interest, particularly in energy, so there's a lot of competition. I don't know, you know, other than increasing the funding, the budget for funding, which is these days in the U.S. is not an easy thing to do uh, for research. Um, I don't know, you know, how to uh, address that. Uh, it's very true. It's difficult to get going. Uh, and good people write good proposals that don't get funded. Um, I know Europe, and Germany in particular, is putting a lot of money into research. And uh, uh, in terms of hydrogen, Japan is really pushing. As uh, a matter of fact, they just announced that uh, their Olympics in 2020, the, uh, the athlete's village will be a total hydrogen village. So all the, oh, wow. I'm not sure exactly what all we're going to do That's with great. hydrogen. Certainly the cars will have fuel cells in them, and uh, I don't know what else they'll be doing, but you know, there's uh, a lot going on uh, in terms of deployment and that sort of thing, and it's unfortunate the uh, fact of life that research funds are are hard to get and uh, the, the funding's going down. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Germany, and uh, in fact, the last time you had a, a major role at an ECS meeting was uh, as part of our energy summit in Boston, 2011, and we had... Uh, a, an individual from uh, one of their research, uh, government research areas, uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Stolten. And I thought, you know, his, his comments were kind of interesting uh, as they were directed towards the, the U.S. Department of Energy. And he, he kind of suggested that um, we need a better plan, uh, that sometimes uh, we're spending some money, even though uh, that, that money has been somewhat uh, flattened out, uh, but we're, the, the way we're spending it is, is in some ways, you know, throwing it on the wall and seeing what sticks. And what do you think of those comments? Uh, I, I just distinctly remember him alluding to that. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, that's, um, I know a little bit about what motivated him to say that. Um, I just think it's a... Uh, uh, the philosophy of, of, the, of the different parts of DOE. I think he was talking about the EERE, which at the, at the time was funding a lot of effort in uh, uh, various uh, hydrogen technologies and other uh, technologies. And I mean, his personal feeling was that they those technologies weren't going to go anywhere, or there were just too many too many uh, small projects going on, and not enough uh, funding towards uh, what he thought was a correct one. So I think it was just uh, him looking at the research and deciding what, in his opinion, what uh, what should get funded and what shouldn't. But I think, uh, you know, DOE, I think, has done a pretty good job, uh, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with, with um, using the peer review process and using uh, workshops and whatnot to get the grand challenges and uh, uh, Big issues on the table, and uh, trying to fund those uh, those particular problems. So I, I think it's uh, a little unfair, but uh, you know I understand what he <laughs> where he was coming from, and, and certainly in Germany they're much more focused on on uh, uh, you know particular mm -hmm. set of technologies. Although this conference, there's a lot of Germans here. This is um, there's a lot of Germans here, and so um, yeah, you can tell that they're trying to broaden out their research projects uh, in, in, in many different areas instead of being so focused. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I would quite agree, but I understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Well, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to criticize, uh, and uh, I mean, particularly since you, you were really referring to the, the scope of what we're trying to accomplish with, with the Department of Energy, you know, funding. Um, and that, that scope led me to some thoughts about uh, the society, our, our organizational scope. As I said earlier, I, you know, I've, I've certainly uh, experienced 
uh, in in recent times, uh, the uh, this this impact of renewable energy uh, has has created uh, almost like a greater relevance of of the organization and the things that we're doing, and um, and so you you weren't that uh, long ago. You attended ECS meeting. I mean, how are we doing with the scope of our meetings? Uh, you know, any thoughts about uh, some areas that we uh, we could uh, have better coverage of, or things that we might want to focus on as an organization? Any thoughts about that? Well, you know, in the areas that I'm familiar with and the areas I'm interested in, uh, I mean, the ECS is uh, the premier spot, or one of the premier spots for the technologies that uh, that we need, batteries and fuel cells and electrolyzers. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, I haven't checked the, the uh, schedule yet for the Chicago meeting, but in the past we've had fuel cell uh, symposium starting on Sunday and going all the way to Friday. Um, certainly there's battery ones, too. I mean, you know, electric chemistry is the key uh, moving forward in, in a lot of these technologies uh, for energy storage, for transportation, which is a big uh, user of uh, fossil fuels. Um, so I'm, I'm, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with and what I've been looking at, um, I, I think the Electrochemical Society is doing a very good job and really contributing to uh, worldwide technology. Uh, we'll have I'm sure all the autos uh, will be there representing uh, their research and their interests, uh, both for batteries and for fuel cells. Um, so I think it'll be a, a electrochemistry pushing this thing. Electrochemistry chemistry society in the meeting uh, is really pushing the technology forward. It's, it's a great forum for people to talk and meet and uh, really discuss the issues uh, of these various technologies. Yeah, well, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Uh, I we've, uh, you know, boy, our, our in, in certain of the disciplines and in, in, uh, topical areas, you, you mentioned all of them. We're, we're certainly seeing also a, a surge on the, a number of contributors and, and trying ways, uh, you know, to create opportunity for all of our authors uh, to, you know, to make uh, present those contributions at our meeting. And and we're actually seeing also a, a rise in our student population uh, that are contributing. So, and I'm not. Uh, sure, I know all the reasons for that. Uh, I, I mean, perhaps you have a thought about. Uh, do you see? Uh, do you see more uh, undergrad uh, engineering and, and, and science students uh, pursuing uh, various disciplines in graduate school that are connected to the renewable energy areas? Uh, absolutely. Uh, matter of fact, I find in my talks that some of the most uh, enthusiastic people are the students. Um, I point out, and they also realize that uh, people my age uh, probably won't uh, see any real big changes in terms of the energy infrastructure, uh, but uh, the students, today's students, are the ones who are going to have to come up with the technologies and push these things uh, forward uh, because it's going to be their world, and uh, they have to live with whatever it is we give them and uh, and change it, and uh, so the, uh, the students of, that I've talked to are just uh, very enthusiastic. They want to get into this energy issue. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with undergraduate students, and uh, they come back and say, you know, this conversation about energy and what we can do and how we can focus our research t towards uh, projects that are important uh, has changed their lives. And uh, I think the realization for the students is, is they're they're the ones that are going to have to fix this. Uh, we can get things started, but ultimately they've got to bring it to fruition. They want the skills. They want the uh, uh, the knowledge. The in, the uh, they certainly have the interest uh, to start to change uh, to change the energy infrastructure. I always uh, uh, joke with them. You know, I'm, I'm 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 just interested in changing the world. That's all. Uh, <laughs> the energy infrastructure, and uh, you know, they, they, that's uh, that's really catching to them. Absolutely, uh, changing the world. How this, how this can happen? Making it a better place, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the whole idea behind uh, these sustainable technologies. Uh, we got to change our energy infrastructure. Let's change it to something that will last for millennia. And certainly, the the technologies that uh, we've mentioned: fuel cells, electrolyzers, batteries, um, and there's others. Uh, but those are the ones, uh, you know, as part of the Electrochemical Society. They're they're really key, and uh, putting those in the infrastructure, figuring out how to 
uh, you know, manufacturing better, catalysis, electric catalysis, all those kinds of things fit in with all that. And it's a great, a great fruitful area, rich area for uh, students to do uh, thesis projects and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it it certainly is an attractive thing uh, that I don't think you always uh, have an opportunity to offer, especially you know early in uh, someone's career that uh, your your work can change the world, uh, change it for better, uh, and that's that's you know uh, sounds like your your experience also is it's a, it's a driving force behind uh, students making these decisions to pursue these fields, uh, which is all good for us. Was that? Was that in the back of your mind uh, when um, you were working with Heinz Garisher? <laughs> uh, no, actually, well, uh, the back of my mind was, you know, what can this technology do and where can it go? I hadn't really uh, thought a whole lot about, you know, students. I was, you know, postdoc at the time, so not that far away from graduate school. Um, it wasn't until later that uh, I started uh, this program of uh, summer interns at the, the Office of Science has this, what they call the SULI program. And um, we started getting undergraduates into uh, the laboratory and started talking to them about their careers and where they would want to go. And uh, so we had great projects on uh, essentially what we do is water study using uh, solar energy and semiconductors. And they started looking at the uh, technologies and working in the lab and they all got really, really excited and uh, matter of fact, uh, um, you know, I've won six uh, outstanding mentor awards from the uh, Office of Science uh, for because the graduate students, I mean, the students when they leave, they write up very nice, glowing reports, and uh, those get back to DOE. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, uh, you know, inspiring them, uh, changing their lives, uh, focusing them on things that uh, are relevant to them, and uh, can and. and Depending on what they work on, but uh, they can they can really have a super impact uh, with, uh, with whatever the research is. Well, you should be proud. That's you know a, a tremendous uh, you know accomplishment. I mean, just beyond the the, the the research and the science part of it is to you know find some of our best and brightest and, and influence them uh, to be contributors to all of this. Um, I'm getting uh, sort of the. Uh, High sign here from our producer. <laughs> so, I uh, I guess I um, want to begin to wrap this up, but I, I didn't want to um, miss an opportunity at least to uh, give you you know uh, some time for any any final thoughts uh, about anything that we talked about today. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I I try to cover the the, the issues that I think are. Uh, are important and uh, relevant to the electrochemical society. I, I one other comment that I will make uh, and probably uh, uh, cause a lot of uh, frowns or chagrins is that I also encourage students to consider getting involved with politics. Uh, as I said earlier, politicians are the only ones with the power and the authority uh, to really make changes in this uh, enormous energy infrastructure. And they need really good solutions, and they need to be able to trust the people they're talking to. And I don't think scientists in general have been very good about interacting with politicians. Uh, we try to avoid it as much as possible. And so there isn't a good communication between uh, uh, scientists and politicians, and uh, the students can change that. They can sign up for some of these uh, uh, fellowships uh, and become you know, part of the congressional staffers and develop those relationships and uh, you know it's, it, it's you know when everybody's thinking right now about you know how uh, um, uh, lobbyists can change those things but uh, you know you gotta have a, a the, the, the politicians can't hear the other side if they don't have somebody telling them the other side so yeah. um, that's the only thing I would add is uh, encourage students to at least get involved locally or nationally in, in politics uh, because their science background is going to be incredibly important. Well, uh, thanks for sharing that last point. Uh, I think it was an important one, and you made a, a number of uh, good points. I think um, uh, we could use a lot of your material for our own marketing and communications. Uh, really, just appreciate you know all, all the things that uh, you shared with us today. 
And on behalf of the ECS and our listeners, I want to thank you for uh, joining us on this first uh, ECS podcast. Well, thank you. It's been really great.